Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Williams, and you are joining me on another episode of Retail Redeveloped. I am I am coming to you live from my from my lovely podcasting studio slash my five year old's bedroom right now because of uh, of the little COVID situation we are we are going through. But I'm very excited right now to to be joined by Tyler Cobble. He is a entrepreneur, CEO, marketing stud uh, from one of my favorite cities in the entire country, Nashville, USA. Tyler, thank you so much for joining me today, buddy. Adam, I really appreciate you having me on, man. I've uh, been listening to the show for a while, and I love how you just have these conversations with some of the most incredible real estate professionals. So I'm excited to be on it. Absolutely, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. So, so Tyler is already putting me to shame because he has like a nice, clean looking studio and I've got like Mickey Mouse toys and, and baseball cards in the background. So you guys try hard not to, not to judge me <laughs> because awesome. of that. But Tyler, before we get started, uh, a lot of people listening to this podcast probably won't be familiar with who you are and, and what your passion is. Do me a favor. Before we get started, just tell everybody who you are, what you do, and, and kind of give us a little bit of the why behind your business and your practice and, and just give us a little bit of background. Yeah, cool. Well, I'll try to be quick with that. So I grew up in Nashville, which was a very different city uh, than what it is today. Uh, when I graduated from high school, went immediately into sales and did incredibly well. I was one of the top sales producers in that company that year. And you know, I was only 18. So I went to college realized that uh, going to school and learning what I already did in eighth grade again uh, was not going to be for me anymore. So I dropped back out, knew that, or I dropped out, knew uh, that I could always go back on, on sales. So I moved back to Nashville, started working as a project manager in construction for my grandfather's construction company. And about three months into that, a developer uh, that I had actually sold to when I was 18, heard that I was back in town. I was, I guess, 20 or 21 at the time. And he paid for me to get my real estate license and told me, you know, hey, I've got the shopping center, I've got this office building in downtown Nashville, I want you to come lease them. And that was in 2013. And the market was very, very different back then. So almost no one was moving. It was very difficult. He had two incredible assets, but they were about 70, 75% occupied, uh, which was really low. So I came in, stabilized those um, over two years, realized I worked myself out of a job and started taking on third-party work. So then we started working with tenants that are looking for space, other landlords that have vacant spaces they needed to fill, investment properties. And then I put together my first uh, development deal, which was a 42-unit townhome development just south of Nashville. Um, after I wrote my book, uh, Open for Business, in February of 2018 is when that launched. I decided, you know what? It's time to go start my own thing. So I founded the Cobble Group, uh, February of 2018, which focuses on leasing, sales, and investments uh, here in Nashville, um, solely on commercial real estate, office, retail, and industrial. Six months later, started Parasol Property Management Company, which is my commercial property management company. And then six months after that, started investing. So I bought a, uh, I've acquired a small portfolio of office buildings here in Nashville, four buildings, about 50,000 square feet. Um, so I've, I've kind of done it all, which has been a lot of fun. That's awesome. So let's, let's, let's back up for a minute. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of people, uh, as, as we were chatting about before the show started, uh, it seems to be a good number of, of young people that either want to get into commercial real estate or, or are fresh in the business. You know, what, what advice would you give to those men and women that, uh, you know, let, let's be honest, you know, you had a you had a good entree into the business, right? You had you had a family member that was in it. That's that's huge, right? That right that that helps a lot. I had a, a family friend that I was in residential, uh, really knew that I didn't want to be in that for forever, even though it's a great business. My wife owns a, a residential company, but I, I knew I wanted to do commercial. So I, I got lucky that I, I had a, a friend that was starting a, a small brokerage firm. But not everybody has those opportunities, and there right. there's not a ton of Kind of guideposts um, for how to how to get in there. If you go to work for a big shop like a CB or Cushman, um, you know they're gonna you know a lot of times maybe just chuck you a phone book and, and say I guess that's that's date me. I guess it wouldn't be a phone. Book. <laughs> I guess it would be a laptop or a Chromebook and that's say right. hey go figure it out. So w- what advice would you give to guys that are young in the business or gals that are that are young in the business? Uh, trying to get up and 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 get their their business started and are just looking for you know, that, that first, that first thing that they can dig into, what, what would you say would good advice would be for them? 
Yeah, I love that question. I get asked it all the time because I'm not very original. You'll you'll figure that out over the next thirty. No, years. no. I mean, I think it's, but you know what? It's one of those things that a lot of people just don't understand how to get into commercial real estate. I mean, it's almost like this shroud of secrecy, like some brotherhood where you know you're you're like meeting by candlelight to get initiated into it. You know, um, I I was very lucky. I mean, most people do not get that kind of entree into commercial real estate. You're absolutely right, uh, and I really didn't realize that for a couple of years. Um, you know, most people will start out, they'll go work as an intern, you know, for a couple of years while they're in college, then they'll become an analyst for two to three years, or they'll become a property manager for a couple of years. And then they'll become a junior broker. I mean, it's, it's tough. So, um, you know, for example, in Nashville, we've got 12 or 13,000 residential agents in the greater Nashville area. There's probably fewer than 400 commercial agents. So it's a much more competitive industry to get into. There's just fewer commercial properties and it takes a lot more specialized knowledge. So you just don't need as many people doing it. Um, you know, what I would say is, you know, I, I mean, I took the boutique approach, so maybe I'm completely biased. Go join a boutique development firm, join a boutique brokerage, uh, avoid the big guys. I think that the big guys do have, um, there's a lot of value there, but to me, you know, the reason that I was able to put a development deal together was because I was around that in the office every day. The reason I'm able to invest in office space is because I was around that every day. And, you know, if I had gone to a CB or a Collier's, they would have said, Hey, you are uh, the industrial tenant rep guy. Here's your box. Here's your box. Yeah. And that's all I would have focused on. That's all I would have been able to learn. And to me, it's just so boring. I mean, of course you can become the best person at that. I mean, talk about becoming the sharpest tool, right? Uh, but that's just not what I wanted to do. So I would say, go find uh, a boutique firm in town, whether that's a brokerage, a property management company, a developer, a contractor, and do anything you can to get your foot in the door. Because what you will learn there, even if, you know, I mean, I tell people this all the time, like go work for free for a few months, you know, work as a bartender, work as a waiter. I did that when I first got started. I didn't make money for six months. Like, even though I had that opportunity, like I didn't make a dollar. That was tough. Um, but go and provide as much value as you possibly can. Learn everything that you can. Get out there and work the streets and hustle. And uh, I mean, to me, that's the best way to do it by yeah, far. You'll learn so much more from more. a boutique firm. And then the one thing that I would add to that, and you mentioned it, you know, it sounds... Uh, you know, kind of tongue in cheek to say, you know, go be a bartender somewhere. But I tell people, I get, I get that call all the time. Like, Hey, I want to get into business. You know, I want to, I want to come in and, and, and start, you know, what do you recommend me do? And I always say, save your freaking money. Uh, oh, yeah. Because if you think you're going to come in and, and knock home some, some big, you know, hundred thousand dollar commission, your first six months into the business or your first, you know, two years in the business, I mean, it happens, right? Some people, some people get lucky or or fall into the right situation, but so you know, rare though. It's so rare, and and I would highly recommend people just you know plan plan not to make a penny for the next couple of years. So, talk to me a little bit about. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Nashville. Um, great town, very similar town to Charlotte. I always say that you know you know Nashville is like Charlotte with the cool factor dialed up because you guys got all the rock stars and we got all the bankers. Uh, yeah. but, but very, very similar markets. Talk to me a little bit about how you've seen Nashville change. And even more so than that, tell me how you were able to, to see that change coming and capitalize on it. Cause let's, let's face it. We're both kind of capitalist real estate pigs. Um, let, let's, let's, let's talk about how you were able to, to watch Nashville transform and how you were able to take advantage of it. Yeah. You know, I think it was kind of, a big factor of being in the right place at the right time. Honestly, I mean, I moved back to Nat. I always knew I wanted to come back to Nashville, like regardless of where I went to college. Um, and obviously I was only at college for about a year before I dropped out, worked on a tech startup and then moved back. But, you know, I knew that Nashville was where I wanted to stay. I just, I love this city so much. It's given me so much when I grew up here. And so I moved back and it was kind of a right, right time, right place. Um, and it was only a, a couple years into that. I mean, in 13, again, nothing was really happening. The residential side was starting to pick up. And that's when I started learning about these neighborhoods in Nashville that I'd never heard of before. They were starting to become super popular and people were, tear, were tearing down one house 
and building too. You know, I tried to get my grandfather to invest in the nations in Nashville five years ago, which is, you know, four minutes from downtown. Well, of course, you know, there's been over 30,000 permits pulled in that one neighborhood in the last five or six years. And he couldn't wrap his mind around it because he grew up there and it was not nice. It was, I mean, it was a bad part of town. So, What's you know, the coffee Nashville, shop in the nations that everybody's obsessed with. Do what? What's the coffee shop in the nations that everybody's obsessed with? Uh, the Frothy Monkey. Frothy Monkey. Yeah. 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 So Frothy Monkey's a, they're a nice, uh, they're a local, uh, local coffee shop. They've got one over off of 12 South They're in the nations. Um, and they're opening up in East Nashville, which is my hood. Uh, I love East Nashville. So super excited. They're coming over here, but yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, Nashville is just such an interesting city because, it was so sprawled out. I mean, it was other than, was it Jacksonville? Uh, in the U.S., it's like the most sprawled out city um, in the country. And so, you know, for Nashville to now be moving back to the city, there's so much opportunity. There's just all this blank space right around downtown um, and right around all the interstates. So it's super easy to come in and redevelop it and, and build these thriving neighborhoods within the city, uh, which is really cool. And then you know, Nashville, not only that, but Nashville has such an unparalleled culture. Like you mentioned with all the musicians, I mean, that live music, I grew up with that. So I never realized that that wasn't a thing everywhere. Uh, such I just a game saw, changer. Yeah. I just saw you yeah, went you, to the You bars. thought there was a rhyme in, in, in every town, right? Yeah. I mean, seriously, like you, you completely take that for granted. We grew up like, you know, you just, everywhere you go, there's live music. There's somebody playing a guitar in a corner singing. And, and I never, you know, I remember going to, um, gosh, where was it? I think it was somewhere in California. And, you know, I was like 18 and we were walking around. I was like, it's quiet. Like you can hear people talking outside. This is kind of weird. You know, you walk up and down in Nashville and like, there's just music coming out of every single restaurant bar. So, you know, that's, that's really unique. And, and, and Nashville's done a phenomenal job at maintaining that culture, even as people from all over the country move here. I think everybody's very intentional. You know, the reason they fall in love with Nashville is that culture. So they want to assimilate into it, which I really appreciate. Um, you know, the other thing is Nashville's geographic location within the U.S. Um, as far as an industrial hub and distribution hub logistics, I mean, there's a reason Amazon's moving here for that. Uh, you know, within a day's drive, you can reach 80% of the population. So, you know, 12 hours, you can be uh, Southern Florida, 12 hours, you can be in New York, or you can be across the Midwest of Texas. So it's, uh, it's a phenomenal location for all these businesses to set up their hubs. And it's a two hour flight to almost every major city. Yeah, Charlotte is, we, we have similar advantages and I don't want to make this podcast all about Charlotte and Nashville and Charlotte <laughs> versus Nashville, but we, we are very lucky in that, you know, we're a huge banking hub, right? Massive, massive banking hub, second in the, in the country behind Manhattan. And then we have this airport that is just unbelievable, huge airport, like one of the busiest airports in the entire world, like top 10 or 12 in the whole world. So we have these awesome competitive advantages and then you have all of the uh, you know historical top tier cities: your, your Manhattan, your Boston, your uh, I guess you would even say DC, Chicago, where the cost of living and the taxes have gotten you know just absurd kind of anti business. And so you have all these people that are being like, "Wait a minute, I can move to Raleigh, Charlotte, Nashville, or Austin for you know seventy percent of what I'm paying now, and all my people want to be there anyway." Uh, so, you know, I don't want the music to stop anytime soon for either one of our cities, uh, because that's, I think it's an incredible opportunity. And I, I think the number, I don't know how this has changed in COVID because it's a pre COVID number, but I think the number was 105 people a day moving to Charlotte. And I'm sure wow. Nashville is probably the same, uh, yep. if not higher. I mean, in Nashville is, is unbelievable. Uh, well, so let, we talked about this a little bit pre, uh, recording, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about COVID. Let's talk about, I know, I know that's something you're passionate about uh, as a kind of a real estate entrepreneur, a guy that tries to stay ahead of the curve. You know, what are you seeing? I, I was on the phone with uh, an investor friend of mine yesterday that lives right in the middle of Manhattan. And he's like, dude, you don't understand. It's a ghost town. freaking war zone slash yeah. ghost town. Everything's boarded up, smash glass everywhere. Uh, now, Charlotte has been lucky enough to to not have you know, quite the same amount of of civil unrest and, and destruction, but Uptown Charlotte, you know, today, middle of the day, you know, almost lunchtime on a, on a work day, the city streets of Uptown Charlotte would be 
mobbed. And now I bet I could go there and, and just walk down the street by myself. So what, what are you, how are you preparing for kind of the new normal and talk to me a little bit about, about how you are keeping your team prepared and just what's going through your head. Yeah. I mean, I think it's bizarre, you know, when all this first started. So, so in East Nashville, we had a tornado that hit, um, the early morning, March 3rd. And we haven't had a normal day since then. I mean, it's, you know, we, we call it, we say the the tornado came through March 3rd and never left. I mean, it's still here. You, you drive around and all these buildings are still just absolutely destroyed. I mean, it was, it was devastating. Um, and you know, so that's, that's funny. That's, that's a phrase that we coined for that. I have another phrase that I've coined about COVID, you know, that was the day the music stopped literally. I mean, and, you know, I, I, had I hadn't drive. thought about that, but in Nashville, yeah. that's, it's such a massive part of your everyday life. And now it, it's crickets. It was wild. I mean, so I drove down to Broadway because everybody was like, you've got to kind of go down there. It's, I mean, it's, it's creepy. It's bizarre. I mean, I've never not heard music, you know, from blocks away pulling up to Broadway and you drive down it. There's no one there. Uh, there's no music. I mean, well, now it's different because, you know, Nashville's entered phase three, but I mean, before, you know, a couple months ago, it was wild, but so can you do, is the music playing again or is it only outdoors? What, how, how are they, how are they doing it right now? So the phase three for Nashville is live music and bars may be open. Um, but there's still, you know, 50% capacity restrictions. So a number of the bars are actually just not even bothering to open. Yeah. We're seeing because, that too. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, I mean, which makes sense. I mean, for the musicians, like if you can't it's a tough margin business to begin tough. with and you do 50% occupancy, it's, it's very hard. Yeah. It's not worth it. And, and, you know, if you're a musician, you're going to play to a 50% capacity, you know, I mean, that's, that's what some of them have been saying. Some of the bars are like, we're just not going to put our musicians through that. Like, you know, there's no one, there's no one that's going to come. So, um, you know, I would say for the first almost 90 days, so like March 3rd through, you know, the first week of June crickets, man, I've, uh, I've never experienced anything like it. It was worse than in 2013 when I first got started and had nothing, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Like at least then people were still kind of like calling uh, and doing things. I'd say my business took a 95% hit in about 72 hours. It's crazy. It's that's exactly what we saw. I mean, we were seeing 5% of the traffic that we were seeing two weeks before. And I, and I love the brokers that you talk to because you always have the brokers and the guys in the business that you're, that you have a personal connection with. And then the guys that you, that you talk to because you have to talk to all the <laughs> yeah. guys are like, nah, man, busy, staying real busy. I'm like, dude, if you're not like mountain biking and going to the beach right now, like, what are you doing? Like, it's, it's I was going to say, well, you're, you're busy at home by yourself drinking beer. Like, what yeah, are you doing? I'm busy chasing my kids around. I know that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, look, we had a number of deals under contract and, you know, everything started slowing down, you know, the 15th um, in Nashville was kind of when they like shut everything down. The first week I was like, oh, wow, nobody's called. Nobody's freaking out. It's like, okay, maybe we're going to get through this. Well, if you remember that following week, we just had that, the, I mean, the stock market tanked three days in a row. I mean, it was like record lows every day. And on that Friday, after it had fallen three days in a row, every single one of our clients called and said, terminate every contract. And we were devastated. And I was like, no, like, let's just extend them. Nope. Th nobody wanted to hear it because they just, they didn't know. Nobody knew it was going to happen. So much uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, those first 90 days, I mean, you think, you know, investors, they didn't know. There's a lot of dry powder sitting on the sidelines. Everyone has cash because this happened so fast. Everybody is, was calling me going, hey, Call me whenever there's a fire sale. Call me whenever, you know, somebody needs to get rid of something fast. And that still hasn't happened. I'm not still even close. Call. Yeah. I mean, nobody's, nobody's in a desperate position yet. Banks have been working with people. You know, tenants have still been paying rent because they've been, you know, gotten this government funding. We'll see in the next couple months. But everything's starting to open back up again. So I think we'll be just fine. Leasing activity, gone. Which makes sense. I mean, if you can't open up and see customers, you can't have employees in, why are you going to look for space? So that's, that makes sense. And that's what I tell people when they, when they ask me, it's like, well, when do, you, when do you see leasing activity coming up? And I'm like, well, I typically work with very sophisticated retailers. I'm a retail guy. Like I'm a, right. as, as you know, I'm a retail guy. And I'm like, all right, so you're going to come in and, and sign a $2 million 10 year lease with me and you're going to have to spend another million bucks or, you know, $600,000, $700,000 building out your space right now. Really? I, I just, 
for me, it's, I, I, I think that we're going to see a lot of uh, interesting, I don't want to call it pop-up because pop-up was a pre-COVID thing. I right. think we're going to see a lot of creative solutions uh, because people are still going to want to grow their business. But uh, I think that it's going to be a challenge for a little while. I, I completely agree. I mean, I think, uh, and we, we can get in that you know, here in a second about how I think everything's going to change moving forward. But you know, development was the only thing that didn't change, uh, which I thought was interesting. If anything, our developers got more aggressive. Uh, and, I, and I have to think that it's because of the development horizon and their timeline. It's 18, 24 months out. And you know, they're looking at this as a blip on the radar. They don't care. Um, so we actually ended up putting under contract some of the biggest deals that we've ever done in the last 90 days, um, which I could not believe was going to happen. Um, so, you know, that was pretty interesting to see. I mean, that entire, you know, three months we, so it's me and two brokers on my team. Uh, we sent out three, four deals. We sent out four deals that entire time. We sent out four deals last week and our phone's been ringing off the hook. We're getting emails now. Our website traffic has jumped up. I think everybody's kind of ready to get back to it. So, you know, the good thing is, you know, Unless we have another massive spike in government shutdowns, I think everybody's kind of ready to get back to work, which makes a lot of sense. Well, let's talk about what you think the future looks like. Let's talk about post-COVID. Let's talk about where you think the market's going. I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, retail has been interesting for a while, right? I mean, ever, everybody's been talking about the death of retail since 2009 or 2008. And, you know, to me, that's just, it's such a buzzword and when people say that, I'm like, do you understand what you're saying? Like, it, it sounds ridiculous. I mean, that's like, that's like, you know, saying, okay, well, Elon Musk invented a self-driving car. Driving's dead. No, it's not. It's just changing. So, you know, I think uh, you're going to continue to see, I mean, over the last 10 years, we've seen retail shift massively to these smaller, you know, mixed use buildings, at least in Nashville, we have. It's, it's all, almost all of the retail development we've had in Nashville is on the ground floor of mixed use buildings. And within neighborhoods, I mean, neighborhood retail is crushing it. I mean, that's not going anywhere. You think about all of the little, you know, neighborhood conveniences, the, the bars, the restaurants, you know, the smaller retailers that service their community, people aren't going to walk away from that. It's not going to change. So how do you see rents? Like walk me through what those mixed use neighborhood rents look like on the ground floor um, because that's, that's one thing that we run into in, in Charlotte, people want the cool historic South end brick and beam converted warehouse buildings. And I get pushback on ground floor retail buildings, uh, even if they're in a cool neighborhood, uh, walk me through kind of what you see as rents in those buildings. And do you guys see that pushback or is the market hot enough where people are like, just give me an address. I just need the address. I need the corner hit me. Right. Yeah. I've, I've actually never had any of that pushback. I mean, we do have some tenants that are like, Hey, this is kind of the vibe that we're going for. But honestly, if you have the right contractor or you do your build out and design the right way, you can get that feel in a new building. And, you know, I mean, Nashville's retail vacancy is sitting at sub 6% right now. So, you know, you don't really have the choice you know, if you're going to go lease space, you're going to have to take what's available. And a lot of what's available is ground floor mixed use. And honestly, I think that that's best for most of these retailers. I mean, you think about it, you know, if you're going to open up a coffee shop, do you want to open up a coffee shop that's, you know, kind of on the edge of a neighborhood uh, where people are going to have to drive, they're going to have to park? Or do you want to be at the bottom of an apartment building with 300 units in it where people can just come downstairs and get coffee? I mean, that and, and not to mention everybody else can come by and park in the parking garage. I mean, to me, that's just so much better for these smaller retailers anyway. So, no, we actually haven't had any pushback on that at all. I think we're, we're going to continue to see, and, and this was trending kind of before all of this happened anyway. Nashville was starting to get so expensive compared to what it was. I mean, for example, that, office, that first office building that I was telling you about that I worked on, when I picked that up, we were at $22.50 a foot full service. By the time I was done, and that was four and a half years later, we were at $32 a foot full service, and we had increased all of our other fees. So there were other fees that were baked into that. So, I mean, that's over a 50% increase in a couple of years. Um, so you think about these small businesses. I mean, that's tough to, to keep up with. I think that um, you know, with prices getting to where they are, construction being as expensive as it is, 
you're going to continue to see a trend towards smaller and more efficient spaces. And uh, I think that that's the case for retail. I think that's the case for restaurants, especially restaurants, because, you know, in Nashville, you would see 2,500, 3,000, 3,500 square foot restaurants all the time. Now they're like 1,600 square feet and they still do just as well. So there was just so much wasted space and you'll see that in office space too. I mean, you know, there's uh, everybody keeps talking about how the office is dead again, just like retail doesn't make any sense just because, you know, people can do zoom meetings doesn't mean that that's actually the most productive thing for a company to do because you don't get the synergy of being around your coworkers. You don't get to build community. So I think that, you know, moving forward, all these companies will have more flexible work from home schedules, but I don't think that they're going to abandon office space altogether. It just doesn't make sense. No, I, I don't think so either. Uh, I can tell you that I'm ready to get back to my office and you no know, most people that I talk to are as well. Uh, and you know, it'll be interest, interesting to see you, everything was wide open, right? It was like no walls, open cubicles. You, know, you can hear the guy next to you chewing gum. I, want, I wonder if this will, will change that. Uh, but I agree with you that I, I don't think that, that that's sustainable. Uh, so let's talk about a couple of the ways that, that you've differentiated yourself. Uh, you know, I've always thought I, I like to market. Um, I, I really enjoy that. I was a, I was a marketing guy in college. I, I, I like to, I like to stay kind of on the, on the, on the edge of that. Uh, and, I, and I know you, you try to stay on the edge of edge of it as well, but I've always struggled with, you know, what social media platform makes sense? Uh, you know, I had a big blog back in the day. Uh, that was a restaurant centered blog that was kind of, uh, right before eater and Yelp and, and those things just completely blew up. And, and, you know, I came to the realization that getting tens of thousands of hits didn't really help my core business because it wasn't the right, right. people, right? Like a 23 year old, 25 year old that wants to know who has the best, you know, wings in Charlotte is not my client. No. Um, so how, how do you try to uh, make your, your marketing dollars and your marketing just you know, bandwidth and, and mental capital count? Like how, how do you rationalize you know, spending time and effort, money on you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube? Like what, how, how did you kind of go through that hierarchy and, 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 and tell me what you've learned? Yeah, I love that. So, so branding and marketing really became my thing. Um, you know, like I said, I dropped out of college, so I didn't have any formal training. I never took a marketing marketing class, not one. So you everything you didn't, that I, a, you didn't miss a ton. Yeah, that's that's what I've heard. I mean, you know, they don't, like all of my friends that you know graduated with business degrees, they know less than I do. Um, you know, because I run a business, so it, it doesn't matter. The real world experience is what actually matters, and you know. When I, um, it's funny how I actually first fell into realizing what a brand could be. I hated shaving, could not stand it. I can tell that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You could definitely tell now, you know, back when, back when I got started, um, I was, you know, using electric clippers. So obviously, you know, that's, you're keeping a longer beard. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to be a lumberjack for Halloween one year. And so I grew it out for 30 days. I was like, actually, I kind of like this. Well, the beard ended up staying. And that became almost an instantly recognizable brand for me, which was totally unintentional. But if you think about it, everybody in commercial real estate, you know, the average commercial real estate broker is like 50 something years old, white guy, clean shaven, wearing a tie, suit. Horse bit loafers. Got to have the horse bit loafers, baby. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I could, that'd be the just, mm, I don't get it. That's not my style at all. Um, so, you know, I immediately like stood out in a crowd of commercial real estate brokers. And whenever I would meet with clients, they're like, wow, you don't, you don't look like a commercial real estate broker. I was like, yeah, I mean, I look, I'll, I hate wearing suits. I'm going to show up in jeans and boots and, and, you know, button down or a polo. And, you know, I'm, we're going to kick some ass. I mean, I, I just, I never understood that part of it. And it ended up, Um, actually helping me build better relationships with my clients because I didn't seem like a salesman. You know, like if if you're now, if I'm going to meet with a bank, you know, a big bank to work with them, I'm going to wear a suit, right? You got to suit up for the bankers. You have to, you have to suit up. But if I'm going to go work with, you know, the local coffee shop that has two or three shops and they want to open a fourth, I'm not going to show up dressed to the nines wearing a suit because I'm going to seem like I'm selling something and I don't immediately fit in. I'm going to show up wearing jeans and a button down. 
because that's what they're wearing. And, you know, it just, it's one of those subconscious things is like, you're, you're immediately relatable, um, which I feel like that wasn't. So anyway, uh, the beard kind of was my first foray into that. And then I started realizing how awful all of the marketing was. Everybody uses these flyers. They take pictures off of Google maps. They throw in some, you know, like literally just facts. There's no copywriting at all. And that's what they send you. They email you just a a flat sheet of paper. So one of the first things I did was we stopped doing PDF flyers. I stopped doing paper handouts. Everything, if you wanted to view any of our listings, you had to go onto our website. And once you did that, not only could you get good actual copywriting as well as the facts, you could see photos, you could see videos, you could take a 3D tour, you could see where it is on the map. You could reach out to us. I mean, there were there was just so much more dynamic. And I could add a Facebook pixel into it and retarget you with ads on Facebook and Instagram. So the the synergy that we got from that was just so much more. So, you know, I realized like, man, at the end of the day, I have the same contacts that CBRE does. How am I going to differentiate myself from a national brokerage if I'm going to go run my own firm? And it was it's the marketing and branding. No one else can keep up with that. So all of our standard marketing um, for everything includes 3D tours. It includes drone footage, includes you know videos, photos. Um, we'd sit down and do all the copywriting. We run Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, sometimes we'll do mailer campaigns. And you know, at the end of the day, what you are as a commercial real estate broker, if you're if you're a landlord rep, you're a marketing company. You're not a sales company. You're marketing. So be the best marketer you can possibly be. And that's that's what we strive to do every day. So that's how we kept getting further and further into content. Because I decided one day, gosh, I guess four years ago, I did not want to cold call anymore. So if you're not going to hunt, if you're not going to hunt, you've got to have so many fishing lines out there that you're constantly catching fish. And so that's when I started the Instagram. That's when I wrote the book. That's when I launched my own website. That's when I launched the blog. You know, that's why we started the YouTube channel. That's why we're going to be releasing a podcast so that there's, you know, all these different ways that people can fall into my funnel. And that's stuff that I enjoy doing. Like I love recording videos and writing blogs. I cannot stand sitting down and making cold calls. So I kind of, you know, designed my business around me. That's awesome. That's a, I think that's terrific advice for, for people that are, that are trying to come in and differentiate. I've always thought about differentiation as, as becoming an expert in a certain thing. Uh, but I, I really like the idea of, of, of showing expertise through kind of turning the, turning the business upside down and, and, and putting your own stamp on it. How else, how else do you think that somebody, uh, can differentiate themselves against, uh, you know, not picking on CBRE, not picking on the big guys. You know, I, yeah, they're I just with, the easiest name that comes to mind. They are, it's they are. Them. That's good branding. I, I work with every one of those guys in Charlotte. Um, almost, almost every single one of the big shops I, I work with in some capacity. So not full disclosure, not, not, not picking on them, but, but how else do you think like, or what have you heard uh, that, you know, from clients, from past clients, from people that you're pitching, that you know, maybe like, hey, I used to only work with CB, but now you know I understand the value. Like, how else? How else have you been able to differentiate yourself and feel like you win business? Because honestly, I mean, our average client is probably fifty years old plus, right? Right. right. You know, five percent of them, ten percent of them have an Instagram account, right? So, like, how are how else are you able to to convince them to not go with, uh, you know, Joe Blow, you know, white hair banker looking guy? Uh, and, and go with, you know, bearded lumberjack guy. That's it. Yeah. You know, actually you would be surprised. Um, we get a massive amount of business through Instagram, um, because, and that's, you know, if if you start thinking about like the people that have grown up with Instagram and social media now, they're in their thirties and early Mm forties and those, you know, they've got money. They're finally, you know, they've been, they're inheriting properties from their parents and they don't know what to do with it. And I'm the guy on Instagram that they've been following that they see, talking about commercial real estate all the time. And so we kind of did that differently where, you know, what, what most people do wrong on Instagram is, Hey, here's a picture of this building. Come to it. Hey, I want you to be my client. Hey, boring. Come it's boring. just shoving sales material down everybody's throats. And who wants to follow that? You know? Yeah. So, 
I've so, always said, man, add value, add value a thousand times before you ask for anything. Exactly. Yeah. Like Gary Vaynerchuk says that jab, 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 right hook. I mean, you know, we, I never talk about that. Like if you go through my grid on Instagram, it's all photos of me and clients and like, you know, cool stuff. We, I always talk about the behind the scenes stuff that we're working on. I kind of open the curtain to commercial real estate because it's such a mystery. And people are also very interested in that because it's what's going on in their city. It's what affects their daily lives. So people love seeing that stuff. And I think that that's why we ended up amassing the following that we did. But think about all the business owners that are on Instagram. Everybody in retail is on Instagram. So we actually get a ton of retail clients through that platform because I'm the only one that's on there doing it right, that's relatable, that they want to follow. And so, um, for example, this is like the craziest one. Two years ago, there was a uh, this group that opened up a barbecue um, like a barbecue pop-up around Nashville. And it was Texas Barbecue, um, the Oak Texas Barbecue. They're actually a client of ours now. We're helping them find a space. But two years ago, I messaged him on Instagram and I said, hey man, love what you guys are doing. My dad is from Texas, love mesquite smoked barbecue. We don't have enough of that here in Nashville. If you guys ever need a physical location, please give me a call. We would love to help you out. Reddit never responded. Two years later, this is like three months ago, four months ago. He shoots me a DM on Instagram. He said, hey, man, we're ready for that shop. When can we get together and grab a beer? That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's very cool. And, and I, that's another thing that I always tell people, not that, not that I'm some you know, Yoda type, type mentor by, by any stretch, but you, if you can't play the long game, if you can't afford to play the long game, you got to figure out what you can change. Because if you're, if you're out there, you know, shoving to, to your, to your phrasing, to your point, you know, shoving sales material down somebody's throat, they're not going to want to be around you. They're not going to want to start a relationship with you. So how are you ever going to uh, do business with them? You know, if, if you're not out there just like aching to add value to people, like I have so many people that are in the restaurant retail business in town that I've never done one deal with. I've never made one penny off of They just call me and be like, Hey man, I heard this from another landlord. Are they bullshitting me? Right. Or, yeah. or what, what do you think about this? Because honestly, it, it's going to come back. But I have Neither resource. no question in my mind that at some point we're going to do business together because there's a trust there. Exactly. And I haven't, I haven't gone to them with my, with my freaking handout uh, from, the, from the second time we ever met each other. So Yeah, uh, and you don't have to because they already know what you do. That's why they're reaching out to you. And that's, that's exactly what I try to be is that resource. Like, look, I'm not going to charge you. you. Call me. I'll call me anytime. I mean, if people you know, message me on Instagram all the time asking questions about this deal and asking how to get into commercial real estate and asking about this and that and how to structure this deal. And man, I'll sit there and I'll respond to every single one of them because I know that, you know, first of all, I love talking about it. So it's like super stimulating and fun for me, but I know that it'll come back around at some point. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on before we, we move on, one of the biggest differentiators that we had is I decided not to niche down into a specific type of commercial real estate. So most guys are like, you know, the office guy, or you're the industrial guy, you're the multifamily guy. Yeah, you're the retail guy. So I, you know, being coming from a boutique development firm, I did office, retail, industrial, multifamily development. We did single family custom homes. We did townhomes. I did everything. And I really enjoyed, you know, having that flexibility to kind of work on whatever I wanted to. And so when I started the firm, I said, okay, well, you still have to niche down somehow. You can't be the, the generalist, right? Um, a, a jack of all trades, a master of none, right? So I decided to niche down into a neighborhood, which was the best thing I could have ever done. Nobody does that. Nobody has done that other than me in Nashville. It's an so old industrial every, trick too. Yeah. You, know, you pick one little park and- A little no pocket. Room everything know where the freaking roaches hide like no every single that's thing it. it's a great it's a great strategy it was, Especially it was in a the, neighborhood that's blowing up like east nashville yeah exactly so you know i'm the east nashville guy so you want office retail industrial you you call me and you get so much synergy from that because i mean i had a client a dentist in in east nashville text me yesterday i was like dude i see your name everywhere and to me, it's like, I mean, that's top of mind. Everyone that's driving around in East Nashville is seeing my signs on all these properties. They literally go to work, they see my name. They come from work, they see my name. You know, they run an errand, they see my name. So eventually you just get such saturation into a market that people will go, who am I going to call? Oh, yeah, well, the Cobble Group, obviously. More, more lines in the water, like you said, more that's lines it. in the water. 
Well, I, you, you've already been very, very generous with your time. Do me a favor. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with some kind of quick questions, rapid fire. rapid fire question before we leave. But before we do that, take a second to tell everybody how they can connect with you. Um, please tell them where they can get your book. Just explain to them a little bit about, about how they can connect with you and follow what you're doing and, and, and get all the beard maintenance and grooming tips That's, that they can, <laughs> that they can handle. I know I've, I've been told I need to get, uh, I need to like partner with somebody to come out with like beard oil and a beard grooming kit. I'm like, well, you know, eventually that'd be kind of cool, but I, I like it. I like it. Yeah. That'd be fun. Um, so the best way to connect with me, if you want to like actually connect with me personally, would be Instagram. Um, I'm at commercial in Nashville. There's underscores between those three words. Um, that's, uh, you know, you can feel free to send me a message there. If you ever send me an email through my website, I probably won't respond because I'm terrible with email. Uh, if you want more education on commercial real estate investing, leasing and management tips, market updates, stuff like that, like what we're talking about here today, um, you can follow me on YouTube. Um, we're releasing videos every day. Uh, and that's, that's probably it. Uh, well, the book, um, Open for Business, The Insider's Guide to Leasing Commercial Real Estate. I wrote that book for business owners that are learning, that are looking to understand the leasing process. Um, but if you're getting into commercial real estate and you want a, you know, quick, you know, hey, here's, here's what business owners need to know. This is what, you know, a leasing agent needs to know. Obviously, to scratch the surface, it's good for you to be on Amazon. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Quick rapid fire. Uh, favorite deal you've worked on in the last 12 to 18 months? Oh, gosh. Favorite deal that I've worked on. Or most interesting or most challenging. I'll give you a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah, that's okay. So there's this uh, piece of property. So East Nashville, it was was run down for a little bit. I mean, it was, it, it's very transitioning. And but it was an old, it was like the oldest part of town. There was this building that was like falling apart. And we I reached out to the owner. And he was like, look, if you can get me anything for this, bill, I, first of all, I don't believe you can get me anything for this building. But if you can, I'm happy to pay you and let you manage it. I'm like, well, I, I can do this. Within three months, we had a tenant in there paying a, an absolute net lease that came in, fully built out everything for him and signed a 10-year deal. So that owner is not... He should put a statue of you out front. That's, yeah. Yeah. Go, go like sign my name on the corner of the building. Exactly. I, was, I was happy about that one because it, it's in a trust for his niece and she's like four years old. And so it's like her college fund. So I, awesome. I was pretty excited about that. And I need, I need an uncle like that. Jeez. My, my yeah, uncle right? <laughs> snuck me a beer before I was 21. That was about the only Seriously. thing I got. Uh, yeah. Hardest lesson that you've learned in your career. It could be on the development side or it could be on the brokerage side. It could be on the business side. It could be on the people HR side, but the hardest lesson you've learned, it could also be the most expensive lesson. Uh, tell me, tell me about that one, that, that piece of scar tissue that, that you had to yeah. learn the hard way. Oh, I've got one. It's the hardest and the most expensive. And we could, we could have a whole nother conversation about this, but get everything in writing. <laughs> everything needs to be in writing. If you can't afford it. But he's attorney. my friend. Yeah. He's my, he would never oh. screw me over. He's well, my buddy. Try, we try, had beer I mean, together. Try family. Yeah. Family is even worse. So I lost uh, $250,000 because I, because I trusted somebody. So, uh, and it would have cost me $5,000 in legal fees. That's worth it. Yeah. So Gary Keller um, calls any kind of operating agreement a, a disagreement because you're never going to look at it ever unless, it unless you're fighting with somebody. So, so get your disagreements done ahead of time because if you don't, I mean, it, it's a good way to keep friends. I mean, it, you, people, people get squeamish about getting things in writing because they're your friend and they should trust them. You want to keep that friend, just write it down because our communication is flawed um, you know, it, it could go anywhere. So I couldn't agree with you, with you more there. Um, yeah. I mean, those, those agreements are not meant for when everything's happy. It's no. for when you hate each other That's and right. how, how do you want that to be governed? Because then you can hand it off to a third party and they can handle that. You know what I mean? All right. Last question. And then I'm gonna let you go again, Tyler Cobble, Cobble group, uh, look at his book, follow him on, on Instagram. Um, obviously, obviously try to support him. And, and, you know, I've really enjoyed, I, I've learned from this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I want to take a second and just acknowledge you for, for sharing, uh, your, your tips and, and, and what you've learned. What has you most excited right now? Obviously everybody's kind of in a foxhole, uh, hunkered down, trying to, trying to hoping another shoe doesn't drop, you know, yep. making sure that locusts aren't going to start like flying through the air by the billions. Murder hornets. Yes. Freaking murder hornets. Exactly. 
Um, what, what has you most excited? What is getting you out of bed in the morning? And, and this could be real estate related. It could be marketing related. It could be development related. It could just be Nashville related. Like what, what has you jacked up right now? Let's, let's end things on a really positive note. Man, honestly, you know what has me jacked up right now is that everyone's so afraid because there is so much opportunity out there right now and there's less competition. So I, I love that. I mean, I've been waiting for this for years. I mean, it was so tough. Everybody thought for the last few years that commercial real estate, you've got to be crushing. It. It's like, well, actually, it's really tough to find deals and we're having to work way harder. So I'm, I'm ready for this. I mean, we're crushing it. So Warren Buffett, be uh, fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful, right? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, t- well, Tyler, again, thank you so much for joining, joining us. My name is Adam Williams. This has been Retail Redeveloped. And uh, thank you so much for, for listening to us today. Thank you, Adam.